Okay, good evening, ladies and gentlemen. My name is Kevin Barkness. I work in the Communications Division of the Department of Planning and Development. I'm gonna be offering some technical support behind the scenes today. I uh, just wanna let you know that this event will be recorded and is live streaming on. Uh, and with that, I will kick it over to Kim. Kim, can you get us going, please? Yes, thank you, Kevin. Good evening, everybody. Um, and welcome to the Bronzeville RFP developer presentation. So my name is Kimberly Morris. I'm a planner with the Department of Planning and Development. Um, and we're really excited to be at this stage of our RFP process and to present to you today the development proposals uh, for city-owned land located at 449 East 47th Street. So I'd like to start today uh, by going over our agenda uh, for the evening really quickly. Um, so we'll start with a, a welcome and uh, introductory remarks from our Alderman Pat Dow. Um, I'll briefly give an overview of what we're looking to accomplish this evening and a recap of the RFP process so far. And then we'll jump into the developer presentations followed by next steps. So again, uh, I want to thank you and welcome you uh, to uh, our RFP developer pr presentations um, as we cont continue our community engagement around the request for proposal process. Uh, so the Bronzeville RFP, which reimagines underutilized land uh, and buildings along the 47th Street corridor is a key element of the Invest Southwest initiative. And so we are here today because the city needs your help. Uh, we really want to hear your feedback on the proposals that were have been submitted. Um, and so this feedback that you give us today will help us advance uh, a selecting uh, development team. So I'd actually like to pause here and uh, introduce our third one, Armin Pat Dow, for some opening remarks. Thank you very much, Kimberly. Uh, good evening, everyone. Um, I'm Pat Dowell, the third ward alderman, and uh, the site we are focusing on this evening uh, at the corner of 47th and Vincennes sits in the third ward in the Bronzeville neighborhood, a proud, historic, and active community. Uh, tonight you will hear three proposals, three strong proposals, but we will only be able to choose one for this site. I'm excited that each team includes people from our community that we know and recognize and addresses many of our community needs. I wanna thank the members of the Bronzeville Roundtable who helped shape the RFP and strongly represented the views of the broader community who gave of their time to help. I wanna thank you very much for that. I want to thank and recognize QCDC, Rhonda McFarlane and Yvette Warren, who serve as our Invest Southwest Corridor Manager. I wanna thank Mayor Lori Lightfoot for conceiving of the Invest Southwest initiative and then putting the financial resources together and placing it strongly behind this program. This program will be a catalyst to further development in our community. I want to thank Commissioner Cox and his team, especially Kimberly Morris, Lisa Washington, Jim Harbin, for being partners with us. I can't get this done. As we move forward to develop our neighborhood. And I want to say in closing that if you have any strong thoughts or opinions about this project and, and that you're hearing tonight, the proposals that you're hearing tonight. Um, please share them with our office at ward03 at cityofchicago.org. Again, thank you. This is an exciting night, and I turn it back over to Kimberly Mars. Uh, thank you so much, Alderman. Um, we at DPD definitely share in your excitement. Um, as you know, this has been a long road, and we thank you for uh, the leadership that you've provided uh, with this initiative. So this evening, uh, we're looking to accomplish a couple of things today. Um, so first of all, we want to uh, meet the respondent teams. Um, 
learn about their proposals, and then provide the community the opportunity to ask questions, uh, share concerns, and uh, give feedback on each of the development proposals. So a little bit about uh, how this evening will proceed. Again, I will start with a, a brief recap of the RFP and how we've gotten to this point. Um, and then we'll dive into uh, the developer presentations, which will be led by our facilitator. Uh, each team will be given uh, two minutes to give a, a quick introduction of their team um, following a, a eight minute video presentation and then a 25 minute uh, Q&A session. Uh, so this uh, Q&A session will be divided up uh, where roundtable members who are uh, on this call as panelists will be able to ask questions uh, directly to the team by raising their hands. Um, and then the general public also will be able to provide uh, feedback and ask questions through the Q&A chat. So um, want to uh, highlight uh, this uh, now. So if you're looking at your Zoom screen at the bottom, you'll see a Q&A function. Um, please utilize this Q&A function uh, if you want to ask questions uh, directly of the development teams themselves. Uh, if you have general questions uh, to DPD, you can uh, email us at dpd.cityofchicago.org. Uh, so again, I wanna kick this off with a really brief uh, recap of the uh, RFP session. So uh, in the fall of 2020, uh, the city launched uh, an RFP process for Bronzeville, which was a key element of Mayor Lori Lightfoot's Invest Southwest initiative. Uh, we enlisted the help of consultants, uh, a consulting group led by the architecture and design firms HOK uh, and the Smith Group, which helped us to develop a vision for the future of this site uh, at 449 East 47th Street and the potential for the entire 47th Street corridor. After a three month community engagement process that included uh, community roundtables, a visioning workshop and one-on-one -on -one stakeholder interviews, uh, we were able to develop the following uh, development concept based on the community's desires. Uh, we want to. Uh, we paid close attention to past plans, and what the community currently said uh, were priorities. Being very intentional and in, uh, asking the development proposals to address walkability, uh, enhance streetscapes, community safety, uh, diverse offering of retail goods and services, and a celebration of community. So the city. Uh, then released an RFP in November and gave the development teams four months to respond. Uh, so in March, uh, the department C received three responses that we'll be presenting here tonight. Um, but the engagement really doesn't stop after this presentation and the feedback period is over. Uh, we wanna utilize the neighborhood roundtables again to continue to engage the uh, development teams once they have been finalized um, and negotiations begin for this site. So as you're listening to these this evening's presentations, we want you to kind of keep the following things in mind. Um, one, your overall impression of each proposal, uh, what excites you, what concerns you, and then thinking about the things that were specifically put in the RFP. Uh, one being around community wealth building. So um, the involvement of minority owned teams and firms within each of the development teams, uh, the promotion promotion of local business development, um, local hiring, and then prior uh, experience of the, each of the development teams. And then lastly, competence and appropriateness. So uh, the uses and the spaces um, of each of these proposals, um, really looking at the context of 47th Street and are they appropriate? Um, do they reflect community priorities? Are they of high quality and design? And then, looking at the overall experience and abilities of the development teams. So how will today's feedback be incorporated? Um, DPD 
uh, we'll be looking to incorporate your feedback in a variety of ways. Uh, first of all, uh, we want to synthesize the comments uh, and the questions that are asked today and develop uh, a kind of a frequently asked question uh, FAQ and then post that to our website. Uh, secondly, we'll be uh, sending out an online scorecard to all the, the registrants of today's presentation. So even if you weren't able to attend, you will get the uh, link to both uh, the developers' presentations and uh, tonight's meeting, um, in addition to a scorecard and a side-by-side uh, -side comparison matrix um, that compares um, kind of apples to apples, all of the elements of each of the, the proposals. So this will be sent out and made available by Friday, May 28th, and remain open for two weeks. Um, and we're also uh, looking at other options for uh, input and community feedback. We want uh, your feedback to be impactful as possible. So we're looking to pilot uh, certain programs around and initiatives around uh, incorporating more uh, of your feedback. So more to come kind of on this uh, in the next coming weeks. And then again, we're, um, we'll be incorporating your feedback uh, tonight in future sessions um, and opportunities to advance uh, negotiations and amend the winning proposal. So um, your the feedback that you provide uh, doesn't end once the development team is selected. We will be using the same feedback uh, as we proceed within this process. So with that being said, uh, I want to begin our developer presentations um, by reminding everybody of the three proposals that we received. So the first one is from KM, WBP, and LG team presenting uh, the Legacy District, which is led by KMW Communities. Uh, we have the Village, um, um, which will be presented by the Bronze Village Partners, uh, led by Millhouse Company. And then the 47th and Vincennes partnership, uh, which would be led by Revere Properties. So I would now like to introduce our facilitator for the evening, uh, Ms. Consuela Brown, who will lead the rest of the discussion. Consuela. Excellent. Hello, everybody. Thank you, Kimberly. Um, it's an honor to be with you. I want to get us back. We're a little bit behind schedule, about five minutes. So if we could get to the next slide. Uh, I just want to go over some quick ground rules, uh, which is, if you could, um, we are a large community. It looks like we're about 264 of us on this call, uh, which is wonderful. Um, what we would like to ask if you could keep yourself mute at all times, unless you're speaking, uh, that would be great. Um, when you are uh, asked to, to speak and how you'll know, so some of you have an option of raising your hand, of course, if you were part of the round table, um, and how you will know is I will call about three people. I'll let you know where you are in the stack, um, ask you to speak, if you could just identify yourselves and then turn your, put yourself back on mute, that would be wonderful. Uh, for those of you that don't have the option to raise your hand, uh, again, uh, as Kimberly uh, shared with you earlier, there's a, a question and answer option uh, that's on the lower right hand of your screen. Feel free to, to post your question uh, there. I will first go to uh, roundtable members, and then I will start uh, looking and, and trying to lift some questions from uh, the q and I do ask that presenters, if you could keep your uh, comments um, as short as possible, that would be great. We try to get as many questions as we can in this evening. Um, and then finally, uh, there's no invalid or, or, or crazy question. Feel free to ask what you um, would like to know um, to the best of our abilities. We'll try to get you those answers. And then finally, if you just could, both in your raising of your hand and in your response to the Q&A, if you can just be mindful to be respectful. So with that, we're gonna get kicked off. We're just, again, about six minutes behind schedule. Um, as a reminder, um, if you start to see this little light, uh, that means that you should be winding down. Uh, and it's my subtle way of saying, thank you, can we move on to the next person? so that we can get everybody in um, uh, to answer a question and or to ask one. So I'm gonna ask Mr. Um, so how this works, and as a reminder, we understand that um, sometimes the audio on the video videos are not as um, loud uh, uh, as, as some people might need. If for some reason you cannot hear 
uh, the audio on the video. We understand that. And there are links um, to each of the videos that you can watch on uh, YouTube. So just to be mindful that we may know that the quality of the video doesn't allow for you to always hear um, and that you can then get that those links. I think we're gonna post them too so that you will have access to them. So with that, I'd like to move to uh, the Legacy District uh, and ask Mr. Bill Williams if you will take uh, two minutes to introduce um, the concept and then from there we'll move into the video. Sure, thank you. I'd like to thank um, the city DPD and the mayor's initiative for this uh, amazing project. Um, you know, we've been waiting a long time for this and, and, and it's here and we're ready to uh, participate in a meaningful way. So I'm excited to introduce the legacy team that's majority black owned and led by proven market rate developers. The primary members are Bronzeville Partners LLC, with, uh, Paula Robinson as the lead, LG Development with Brian Goldberg and myself, Bill Williams, founder of KMW Communities. The Legacy District is designed as a destination to promote growth and development while respecting the past and looking into the future. The project is not only a structure, it's a, it's a systematic approach to wealth creation and uh, community wealth creation. The, the building is also demonstrates uh, design excellence um, that provokes an emotional reaction that elevates what is possible in the neighborhoods. You know, we also included some smart features that also look into the future. This 25 unit mixed use building is a market rate building that is realistic and executable by experienced market rate developers that have produced dozens of these projects, high end projects and similar size and scope all over the city. We know how to do this work. We frankly, we've done it before and we're still doing it. Not only on the north and west sides, also on the south side. We were one of the first developers to bring a 30 unit market rate development to Wulong who haven't seen new market rate development in over two decades. This is $16 million of unsubsidized investments because we believe in this neighborhood. We wanna see it grow and prosper. The development team has also delivered hundreds of affordable units on the south and west side and all the targeted, most of the targeted invest in Southwest areas before it was an invest in Southwest. So we've dedicated a lot of our careers to this to these areas. The legacy district has also taken a community based approach, a strategic approach to generational wealth creation by reducing the barriers. We are reducing the barriers. That's the overall strategy. We think that reducing the barriers equates to equity. It, it equates to equality. And some of those tactics are participation, access to capital, a preferred home ownership lending programs that lower the cost of entry level to get rid of some of the student loans, a structured mentee, mentee, mentee protege relationships throughout our, our, our team and also to the community, a programmatic funded entrepreneurship center that's real, that's ready to go day one, a community-based entrepreneurship flex center and a culinary flex center that's ready to go. We're just excited to be a part of the transformation of Bronzeville and to be a part of the future uh, while respecting the past. And we've been doing this before Invest Southwest, and we want to continue to do it. So we look forward to this, this process. I'm really excited. Thank you, Mr. Williams. Now, if we could just view, uh, queue up the, uh, the project uh, video. And again, remember that audio may not, some of you may not be able to hear the sound. Do we, do we have the video? So, so Mr. Williams, while we're waiting, um, there's a question about how many, uh, and maybe that's gonna be answered in the, in, the, in the presentation about the number of jobs that will be created through the project. Sure. 
can I can start answering that right away. Um, so um, there's going to be roughly 340 jobs created, and uh, 240 would be temp, 140 would be permanent, and then there's also an unknown factor of how many jobs that we'll be able to create um, in this uh, flex space, and how many entrepreneurs are going to come out of this flex space, and how many entrepreneurs are going to come out of out of the um, the YWCA's entrepreneurship center. So that number could be unlimited, and this number can be into the, into the decades. Thank so we have that we have created a system, a system that will go beyond us. This system will stay in place when we're gone. The system will stay in place when people leave this property. So this it will continually create jobs. Thank thank you. Are we ready now for the video? Perfect. Thank you, Mr. Williams. If there is audio, it is not coming through. You know, I don't, if there's no audio, it's really hurts the presentation. Apologies for that. We're going to try that again, guys. Do we do it from our end? No, we have it. We're just going to uh, start that again. Apologies for the delay. We're starting. Kim, are you able to turn up the volume on your end? Okay, we're going to try to get you the link to the video and hear it. Kim, is it okay that if the project team can pull it up and we can hear it, it might, I, I want to make sure that everyone is able to get the same video at the same time. Yes, I would suggest that as well. Kim, if, if you would like to, to allow me to share my screen, I can try it on my end. Uh, yes, can you please try that? Can you try it from your screen, please? Can everyone see this? Uh, we can hear, we can't see. Can't see it. Okay. The legacy district is about more than a 25 residential unit and 13,000 square feet. What about now? We can, leave that equity we can see your desktop. If you got a double, if you got double um, screens, you probably won't take one down. All right, I'm gonna try this one more time. I think I got it now. Participation and wealth creation. Our plan includes the reduction of the barriers of ownership by providing. Can you see it now? There we go. There we go. Why don't we restart it and then we can I believe that equity begins with opportunity and ownership. This statement is the foundation of the legacy district. The legacy district is about more than a 25 residential unit and 13,000 square foot commercial building. It's a systematic and structural approach to community participation and wealth creation. 
Our plan includes the reduction of the barriers of ownership by providing programming for home ownership, access to capital, a kickstarted culinary entrepreneurship center, a women of color entrepreneurship center, funding partners, structured mentor and mentee relationships. This project would be catalytic. We see the potential up and down 47th Street. We see the, the, the development cycles. We also understand the phasing of this community. So the Legacy District will create roughly 344 total jobs. 204 will be temporary and 140 will be permanent. There will also be a substantial tax revenue that's generated from the food and beverage, transfer taxes, and the property taxes. This team was intentionally designed for mentor-mentee opportunities and participation and wealth development opportunities for the community and for all its participants. And the RFP also specifically asks for market rate development. And we are market rate developers. KMW has been developing market rate products for over 16 years. LG Development has been doing it for 16 plus years. We have over 30 years of market rate experience, and we coupled that with Paula Robinson, who leads Bronzeville Partners LLC. We're creating options for housing, and we know that the community recognizes that we need to be a diverse income community as well. That's a part of what always made Bronzeville sustainable. We're really now recognizing a lot of what is there in the community and making sure that we're not just formalizing the space, but we're really identifying by design that this is a destination. We already have term sheets in hand from a CIBC Bank, who is a local but also national lender with a big presence in Chicago. The term sheets that we have from CIBC are actually in three parts. One is for the senior construction loan, in the amount of about $6.8 million. They're also agreeing to finance 75% of the allocated TIF from the city, as well as invest equity into the project. So the equity needed to do this project is about $3.5 million, and CIBC has an equity arm dedicated to do that. The remainder of the equity, approximately $1.7 million, is coming from LG and KMW personal funds. One of the most important goals was also to just create not just a building, but a, a building for a community, a destination, something which opens up and actually mm -hmm. serves the community and not just the residents. I don't know if you can really call a building dynamic, but I feel like this is a dynamic building. So our process has been integrated in the designing and the collaboration, but that integrated process for us is through every step of the project. So the idea is that we would be working continually with community through every step and that those steps would eventually lead to a successful project that is in and of the neighborhood. To us, legacy means designing for the future. In designing the building, we listened to the needs of the community. The community wanted larger three-bedroom units for larger families, family-friendly units. So we maximized the density on the site and we've provided 25 units, with the majority of those units being three bedrooms that range from 1,600 to 1,800 square feet. So imagine a folding ribbon, which comes out of the scale of the neighborhood, folds and ascends up to create a diverse spatial configuration in the site to create an expressive form, but also a variety of interactive spaces, the plaza, a, a rooftop garden, and finally peaks in the art beacon, which is a overhang over the plaza, which really defines the urban space and uh, includes the art, which is so important to, for the building. It actually influences the form quite well. Bronzeville has never seen a building like Legacy District. People want to be here. They get everything they want in a home and everything they want in a neighborhood. This opportunity is not only for us to bring a catalytic product and project to the neighborhood, but it's also to add to the culture, add to the language, but it's Bronzeville. The Legacy District really is speaking to so many generations that came before, speaking to even the birth of Bronzeville and how Bronzeville came to be such a cultural hub. This legacy project will not only be speaking back to the idea of our history, but it gives us that foundation as to how we want to move forward as a community. Being a part of a project this huge means so much to me in so many different ways. A, it's a project that's in my community. B, it's something that I've dreamed of. And C, it's something that will push me to another limit. It's putting me in spaces and places that would have maybe taken me years to get to. To me, what where it really clicks with landscape architecture is that it's in our DNA. It's like this visceral thing to be in and around nature. So much of our spaces in the city are deprived of that. So if we can really integrate this 
into the front plaza, onto the stairs, this sort of vertical green element, onto a farm on the rooftop. It becomes a space that the community can really own and take over and, and want to be at. The programming of the building was intentional from this unit size, tenant selection, and wraparound services. The YWCA, in partnership with DePaul University, will house its Women of Color Entrepreneurship Center. Bronzeville is a historic community on the south side of Chicago. Although it's one of the most affluent African-American communities in Chicago, it has currently almost a billion dollar retail gap. So this initiative that we're partnering with to launch our Women of Color Accelerator is solely designed to try to increase the opportunities for women of color entrepreneurs to help them grow their businesses, help them launch successful ventures that can ultimately employ people from the community and close that retail gap. In 2019, Black entrepreneurs received about 3% of $24 billion of VC funding, of which women of color received the least amount of all groups, which is 0 0.006. Entrepreneurship is such an important part of community economic development. They go hand in hand. With the Chef um, Culinary Artist Incubation Program, we can literally take people and have them come in at a very low cost, start a business, and if successful, take that business down the street, stay in the neighborhood as they increase their brand, and really do a fine job. And we can do this a countless amount of times over the over the coming years. Bronzeville being such a stable community on the south side of Chicago, there's so much beauty and culture in that neighborhood. You know, I think an opportunity like this will, will allow me to be able to showcase such a special brand in front of people that are well-deserving of it and then also put us in a better position to hopefully franchise. As an artist, as an entrepreneur, as a South Sider, this affects my business tremendously. One of the issues I've been tackling over the years is that of community blight and understanding how the blight affects community psychology. What we're looking for and excited about is development. We're a continuation of that legacy and having those options on where and how you want to live. And so as we're focused on wealth building strategy, having this kind of affordable home ownership choice is extremely important. I want to dedicate our team's effort to an African-American entrepreneur, Jerry Oliver. This is a female entrepreneur who held down 47th Street for decades. And every day she opened and closed her shop by herself. When you ask her how she was doing, you can stand on her answer, hanging tough. Thank you so much. Um, so we'll get, uh, we're a little bit behind schedule, but let's, uh, if there are questions that people would like to ask of the Legacy Project team, um, we can get started. Uh, if you'd like to, if you're a part of the uh, round table and would like to raise your hand, please do so now. Uh, if not, I'll start to field questions from the Q&A. And the first question is, how can we expect to see arts and, and, and arts and economic development integration? I think I can take that. Uh, we have a, a, a tenant um, that is an artist that's gonna run a program um, that's called Artist Life. And Artist Life teaches entrepreneur, teaches artists to be entrepreneurs. A lot of artists, they just love the craft, but now they're thinking about the business side. So this programming by Griffin Gallery called artistlife.org, they will show these artists how to monetize their skills. Thank you. Um, and then has, there, uh, has the job creation system been accomplished before and where and where? I think you started to, to uh, Mr. Williams, I think you started to talk about some of the other places where you've had um, some success. So maybe you can talk about one or two projects uh, that, that demonstrates that you've had a track record, uh, a successful track record in creating job, jobs in other communities. Sure. Like over the years, um, our market rate projects are north of, 4 million, 5 million, 10 million, this one. On the south side, it's combined 16 million. And then that $16 million has a job creation factor. And that 16 million uh, in the job creation factor on the construction side is 3.8. So, so out of that 16 million, it creates roughly 50 jobs. So as this process goes on and on, uh, the job creation is just apparent. And, and, and also when, it, when you're dealing with new construction housing, um, there are studies um, that show that the economic impact of someone buying a house, just buying furniture, just buying 
new accessories for the house. It, it has a job creating factor to it as well. So we've been, as I said, we've created dozens of new construction market rate housing and that created countless numbers of jobs. Thank you. And so how would the, the culinary part be different from the new commercial kitchen in the Gallery Guchard building across the street? So this, this, this proposal, um, it gives you a low barrier of entry. So given the, the budget or given the city assistance uh, and the funding, we would pretty much put a, uh, a culinary entrepreneur in a space fully built out and you just bring your talent. And you end at a very low cost and you, can, you have a runway to build your business. And once you build your business, you can graduate out of the space into the community and someone else will take that spot. And I can add to that just a little bit um, too, because uh, as LG, we've built and um, kickstarted many restaurants over the years. We're very proud of this concept, but essentially what we have is an anchored ground floor market slash restaurant concept with a master operator. Um, and it's a very, very wide open space. We have the ability to integrate um, arts um, concepts and, um, and different events, but more importantly, upstairs with this, we also have a very nicely sized um, area with a bar and a minimum of five incubation kitchens, which is what we're calling them. Essentially, they are a little bit larger than you'd find as a kitchen in a food truck. We all know that food truck concepts, when they catch on, can be very exciting. Um, you know, developing a brand um, for a young, inspired chef, um, especially, uh, you know, one that doesn't have the need but has the passion. Um, or the means, but has the passion, we have that ability to get them in and they don't have to buy any equipment. Really, they just have to show up. Um, we can provide them with expertise, with the services to be able to grow um, and learn as an entrepreneur. Um, and all they really need to have is that passion and that talent um, and they can grow their brand. And that's what Bill meant by job creation because essentially um, any given restaurant, they may start with zero employees and just be cooking and and get that brand out there and uh, you know, be able to in six months, a year, year and a half, grow into a space down the street. And uh, as we know, even a small restaurant can employ up to 20 or 30 people and a sizable restaurant can be you know, 100 plus. So as we develop this, if we can do five at a time and uh, hopefully develop you know, five different restaurant concepts every six months to 18 months, um, the quantity of jobs that we can generate over the long haul is truly unimaginable. It's very hard to count, but as more people become successful and as we provide those resources, um, it's really very exciting. It's really very exciting. Thank you. And while you're uh, unmuted, can you just this question about um, LG acting as both developer and contractor on the project? Great question. Uh, so happy to. Yes. Um, LG, um, we've grown over the last 16 years. We are a developer and a contractor on this project. Um, we are um, doing a mentor mentee relationship and Bill has actually been building for, I think a little bit longer than I have. Um, so LG here is acting more as the developer to help structure the finance um, and bring our resources because we've done um, countless projects over the years within the city. Um, and Bill really has a strong presence, uh, especially there on the South side. And uh, with his construction experience, Bill would be acting as a general contractor. Um, so we're able to achieve um, not only guaranteeing that the project is successful finance, uh, financially, um, that we have the resources and the, and the debt and all of that kind of stuff we need to deal with, but you know, having boots on the ground and having Bill be able to run the construction um, and really be hyper-local in the hiring process, um, sourcing everything from labor to subcontractors and helping those subcontractors to become more established entrepreneurs themselves is really what this is all about. Great, thank you. Um, so the question, we'll, we'll go back to you, Bill, and um, the building looks great and it fits well in the context of the neighborhood. Uh, this, the, based on the RFP summary, the total project cost is 19.4 million, um, which it, it seems aggressive for a 75,000 square foot building. Um, can you shed some light on how the project can fit, can hit the, uh, the budget targets? So I will, I'll let Brian uh, answer that because he uh, worked primarily on the numbers. I usually, the person who did the numbers, I usually let them talk about that, even though I can, but he probably, you know, he's closer to them. Um, the commercial space also is very expensive and, and, the, and the concept um, that we're going to fully build out 
these kitchens and fully build out these uh, flex spaces, it's a considerable cost uh, that I think the RFP did not include. Um, the RFP uh, also included um, the gross square footage versus the net, net um, sellable square footage. Um, so that's something that we'll talk with DPD at a later point. But Brian, you can you want to add to that? Um, I think you nailed it. Absolutely. I mean, obviously, these are all preliminary, but um, this building has is, is been designed to be attractive, yet very efficient to build. Um, we've done many buildings in this um, kind of, you know, size range. Uh, so we're very familiar with today's, you know, construction methodology and being able to do this out of lightweight materials, metal panels, um, brick, cold floor metal framing. And as Bill said, um, working with the city in order to achieve um, the remainder of the cost, which is very important to these incubation kitchens and things, having these um, systems kind of up and running when we deliver the building is going to be um, key to um, executing this proposal. Excellent. Uh, DB, uh, the planning team, just so you know, I, for some reason on my end, I'm not seeing people if they have, so if you have your hand raised, unfortunately, I don't see it yet. I'll just keep moving to the question and answer was uh, section. We have about five minutes. Um, so there was a question about uh, how many MBE um, um, partners are on this team and how many live in, uh, in, in the actual neighborhood? I can take that too. <clears throat> so all of our consultants are primary MBE or WB. I think 90% of them are. Um, our architects are from the south side. Our urban plan, our urban plan, not our urban planners, our, our, our landscape architects are from the south side. Um, KMW is WBE. Um, so we tend to exceed the WBE, MBE uh, allocation just by default because of our team makeup. And we uh, will strive to do even more. Uh, we hope to uh, have a robust uh, outreach for other contractors to actually exceed that. And I'll, I'm sorry, I would just like to add into that. Um, a majority, um, a good amount of a team lives in the neighborhood, um, have roots in the neighborhood, um, families have grown up in the neighborhood, so we're very familiar with what the neighborhood and what it needs and, and what we've been waiting for. So just to add that. Thank you. Uh, so there's a question about how this development might accommodate uh, accommodate generational needs um, for early child education to young adult families and seniors. Is there somebody that can answer how that is going to factor into your plan? So I think the building is designed an ADA building and it's also built for families. Um, and that's home ownership with translate to generational wealth. And we know generational wealth is using the foundation of wealth creation because it gives you the opportunity to do other things like pay for school, start a business, um, you know, pay down a high interest loan, which also leads to wealth creation. So that would be, you know, by design uh, of home ownership will help the next generation. And there's a question about uh, how, what amount, if any, of TIF funding um, are you going to be pursuing from the city to support? That number still is, is not, it's undetermined, um, depending on the final uh, design of the building. Great. Thank you. Um, and then finally, are the, are all the homes for purchase? If so, uh, what would the range be? And is there parking structure attached to the development? Um, we have our sales team on the call who's also local and from Bronzeville. Um, if one of the sales team would like to take that. Hi, I'm Michelle Brown and we're very excited about the development and what it's going to mean for Bronzeville. Uh, just nothing like it has been built in the last 30 years. Um, so we have our three bedrooms are up to, in fact, over 1,800 square feet. Our two bedrooms, 1,400 square feet, and our one bedrooms at around 1,000 square feet. We do have parking for every unit. We're also obviously very close to transportation. We're looking for sustainability in the building, and we're expecting that people who are coming to the building to purchase will also be um, interested in the transportation, the wonderful transportation that's nearby. And this is Naja Morris to I'm also on the MB team, the sales team. So to piggyback off of that, we often talk about sustainability and we think about the utility and we think about the energy efficiency, 
But we're also thinking about the amenities in the space and the multi-generational function. Will future generations want to live in this building? So all the units will have outdoor spaces, an elevator, attached parking, an exercise room, a community room, a rooftop deck with a sustainable garden. So we're ensuring that the product is not just beautiful, but the units are gonna be functional and for the future generation. <laughs> Thank <Okay>. you. <laughs> <laughs> underscore, underscore. Um, <laughs> and can, <on> <laughs> are, are, you, are you done? Did you wanna say anything more? No. Okay. So uh, I'm going to take maybe four more questions. Um, uh, William Davis wants to know, can you speak to the sustainability um, aspect of the development in terms of reducing Bronville's carbon footprint or feeding back into the grid? Sure. Um, the building with modern techniques and modern materials, this building would be um, Silver Lee certified just from the jump. And the way it's designed now, Omni um, has a, a, a green roof and a, and a, and a rooftop garden. Um, and so those things would absorb some of the, the toxins um, just by, by nature. Um, and we have our lead architect on the line that can also speak to that. All right, I'm Lars Gravener from uh, Volume 1. Um, the, the sustainability aspect of this uh, building is very important as um, we try to uh, maximize its resiliency. Um, we reduce energy consumption as much as possible by really high quality construction. Um, we also uh, are very aware of the fact that uh, today reduced water consumption is extremely important, um, that we mitigate the heat island effect, which is uh, detrimental in cities today, uh, by basically giving 100% of the area which we're losing as the site, as an open site back um, as roof gardens. Um, so we, uh, the site is about 26,000 square feet and we are generating 26,000 square feet of green space um, of which 5,000 is a public plaza uh, with a majority of green space as well. So that's a, a pretty good number for um, Heat Island. Uh, as well as stormwater harvesting, which is extremely important to reduce cost, but also fresh water usage. Um, 10,000 square feet is allocated at the moment on top of the building for uh, energy consumption or, or energy production uh, for photovoltaics, which can be paired with a green roof. And um, um, I think this is probably the, the majority of the sustainable aspects which we have in the building. I just want to add one quick note. I'm sorry, I yes. didn't mean to cut you off, but when we talk about uh, community and health and everything, the fact that everyone has access to outdoor space, there's also a large community space available on the second floor with both farming and rooftop access. And this is all of it uh, accessible from the ground floor, the second level access. So there's both private and public spaces to enjoy the outdoors within the density of the city. Okay, so I'm gonna be wrapping us up. We're a little behind, so I just want maybe two more questions. One of which is, what are the MBE, WBE participation goals uh, and will there be an effort to use contractors that are part of the neighborhood? Oh, absolutely. So, Our goal is um, to far exceed it, um, the, the, the 26, six and six goals. Um, just by our team makeup, we're probably at 50% now so, and we will have a, a consultant to help uh, with our outreach. We also, um, we contact the, 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 uh, the QCDC, you know, all the resources, the Alderman's office um, to get a, a, a robust awareness program out um, to get, you know, contractors ready and get community people ready for this opportunity the minute that we start during the design process. Because sometimes you need a runway to allow people to get ready for the opportunity. We also have some partners, uh, workforce partners, that will also help us get, you know, community uh, engagement and community workforce prepared. Thank you. The last two questions, the the, uh, and, and then we'll um, thank you and and um, transition to the next team. Is essentially, uh, what is your um, current outreach strategy to involve the community in this? Uh, if you were selected to to uh, help with the rollout of the plan? We have, um, you know, Paula, 
Robinson as a, as a critical um, owner and community developer. Uh, she on the line, it's like 50 people here. I can't really tell. Yeah, she is. She's on the line, Paula. Um, could you speak to that? Yeah. And we've, and we've really utilized this Invest Southwest process and this application to begin. Uh, immediately, we're going to have tremendous comments from the community survey. You know, just reading the uh, Q&A now, you know, there are 40 questions. I know, Consuelo, that we can continue to answer those even after we're off. Uh, but this is, you know, this is what's key. And so the interactivity of uh, one, being able to respond to questions, and obviously all of the things that we would do as it relates to uh, not only website and social media, but I think what we have learned even through this opportunity with Zoom is that we have far greater opportunity to be uh, on a timeline with the community on a regular basis. You know, there's a question that says, okay, when you, uh, you know, choose your, your vendor for the upstairs dining and lounge, you know, will we know who that is? Absolutely. We want to be doing this regularly. So I think that part of what we have done, uh, as the RFP suggested, was to look at our own cumulative knowledge. We've been involved in all of the plans that were listed in the RFP. Um, when we've been talking to our developer team, you know, this is not something that we are pushing. This is something that the community is ready for. And so, you know, one of the questions talks about the fact that we really followed what the RFP asked for. You know, the alderman is saying we need market rate housing. We believe that's true. We think that this 47th Street corridor has put in the two bookends at both end, the generational housing and affordable housing at the Rosenwall at one end, and then shops and lofts, you know, at the other. We already know that we can attract uh, market uh, national credit tenants like Walmart and others. We want to do more in terms of entrepreneurship. And when Robert tells us that figure of what that retail leakage is, you know, we're not surprised. We already have a thousand seat theater at Harold Washington. When they, when they let out after a great show, we don't want one person, you know, feeling like they need to go to Hyde Park or South Loop. We want them to have the full experience. That's what a destination means. And we are ready, we've been ready to do it. So we're excited that the time is now. Yeah, and if I could just add to that, this is Robert Johnson from the YWCA. Um, we are already in Bronzeville um, with our uh, Housing Access and Sustainability Department. Uh, we recently acquired uh, Partners in Community Building, which, uh, which resides in the Rosenwald Building. Um, so we're excited about the opportunity to expand housing access to folks uh, from within the community. Um, it was, as was mentioned in the video, uh, also bringing our Small Business Development Center uh, to provide entrepreneurial resources for individuals from the community to help them start businesses, get access to capital. So the, the whole point of the legacy project is to build wealth and to close that retail gap. So um, the, the focus from this day forward is really about engaging the community in a strategy that's going to propel Bronzeville into the next phase. And this is Shavaz, just to add on to that, and I know we're trying to end, I'm sorry, but, but, but Bronzeville, I mean, it, the, the, the legacy part is, Bronzeville has been so historic, and we have been missing out, so many people that live in the area, we want more, we deserve more, and, and, it, and it's been a slow process, so I think this is something that will keep people in the neighborhood, because there's a lot of things that people want to be able to do, they want walkability, they want to be go, able to go to restaurants, they want retail, and we're losing a lot of people to other neighborhoods that is not their community, but they want that type of accessibility. So by bringing that here to Bronzeville, I think that's just the start of the beginning of what we need and what we're looking forward to. So me being a Bronzeville, living in Bronzeville, family from Bronzeville, I'm excited that this team can bring that to it because we're much overdue for it. So that's my two cents. Beautiful way to end. I want to thank uh, Mr. Williams and his team, uh, the Legacy Project. Uh, we'll tr continue to try to answer some of the questions that are in the Q&A, uh, but to try to get us back on track, um, I would like to invite um, Melanie Milhouse uh, Jeffries and her team uh, from the Bron uh, Bronze uh, Village to get queued up and get ready to um, uh, make your introductory uh, statement. And I want to welcome Alderman, Alderman, uh, Alderman King uh, to this discussion. Melanie? 
Great, thank you so much. As our team gets settled, good evening, everybody. Thank you for being here, uh, Commissioner Cox, the DPD, Alderman Dow, Alderman King, the Community Roundtable, and community residents. We really appreciate your time and efforts that you put into this. Um, for those that do not know me, my name is Melanie Jeffries. I'm the lead developer for the village at Bronzeville. I'm very excited to be here tonight as the first women-led development team um, in this initiative and representing my area. Bronzeville is so exciting and I feel so blessed to be able to do that. Um, I'm with Millhouse. Um, we are an umbrella company, so we have construction, engineering, and development, along with a ton of other services internationally and um, nationally. Uh, we have an amazing team here, as you can see tonight. Um, Co-development partner Tori and Fred with the Imagine Group. Wilbur Millhouse is here with Millhouse. Herb Dawson with W.E. O'Neill Construction. Juan Moreno with JGMA, our architect. Rachel Voss with Sisters Cities, our programming partner. We have Sarah Ware with Rare Realties, our realtor. Candace McCoy Cunningham, our property manager. Um, we have Juan Teague, who is many things. She's a community partner. She's one of the business owners, and she's actually on the committee for culture and tourism to make sure that we make this site um, an attractive and a place to be. Um, and we have a ton of our other partners that we couldn't fit all on the screen that are here in the chat if you'd like to ask them questions as well um, as the video is playing. Um, what we wanted to say as far as what makes our proposal very unique um, is how we connected with the community, how we're ingrained with the community already, um, how our programs and businesses that we're bringing to the table that are part of our development and exclusive to our development um, really drive this home and make it work and, and will make this really function for the Bronzeville neighborhood and help it grow. The amount of thought and effort that was put into long lasting equity, building black generational wealth, empowering women of color in prime positions in development. And um, not only just thinking about one site, but thinking about an entire corridor and uh, making it a cultural destination. So those are some of the things that we wanted to say um, and we can play our video. Do you want me to bring it up or you guys want to bring it up? Uh, I'm, I'm going to bring it up. Uh, this is Kevin Bartmus uh, on support side here. I will pull it up just one moment. Uh, Consuelo, this yes. is Alderman. Can you ask the, there seems to be some other people from the previous teams whose videos are still on. Oh, okay. Just to, yes. Just to repeat that. Yes. So once you are, once you are uh, the legacy project, if you could, um, Take yourselves, uh, turn your cameras off. We would appreciate it. And for um, the Bronzeville team and for the 47th uh, uh, Vincennes team too, as you are uh, ending your presentations, if you could be so kind as to turn your, your cameras off and uh, mute yourselves. Are we ready, Kevin? Can't hear anything. The sound issues. Um, okay. It looks like we're again having some tech technical difficulties. Yeah, uh, Melanie, are you in a? Yeah, Melanie's ready to, to, to pull it up. Melanie, go ahead then. Chicago, we really take pride. Can you guys hear? 
Yes, we can. Okay, sorry about that. Example of this is IHOP. 
We brought in IHOP, but it's not just any IHOP. It's an IHOP with an incubator attached. In partnership with IHOP and Inspiration Corporation, we're going to train local community members on how to work, operate, own, and manage their own franchises. And in particular, potentially IHOP franchises. Additionally, we're bringing in local community artists and we're going to work on partnering with local community churches to have events taking place in this IHOP that have music and post-church community gathering events. In addition to having restaurant incubation, we're bringing partners like Imagine E-Bikes to the stage, which will bring manufacturing jobs back to the community. The e-bike economy is growing really quickly, and Imagine e-bikes is going to bring an American-made bike manufacturing and production facility and assembly facility in partnership with Westtown Bikes, who's going to help train some of the local community kids and young adults in that into uh, mechanical engineering space as well as electric e-bike service and repair economy. We've partnered with a major telecom company to bring 5G wireless internet as well as hardware and software um, for this tech-enabled space. And this space is going to be used for the community to come in and conduct regular business needs in office space and meeting spaces, as well as a print shop and a mail room. It's really important to us that your apartment feel like your home. And so we understand that security is a big factor, but we don't want anyone to feel like they're uncomfortable with the presence of security. The Village of Romeville isn't the first one to invest in this particular community. We have stakeholders that have spent decades of work in this community. Houston Gibson, Bernard Boyd, Julian Till, Pastor Chris Harris. These individuals have invested their life work into the Bronzeville community. And we're here to build off of that. We believe that this project could be a catalyst to bring other national retailers right here to this spot that these others have laid foundation for for decades. One of the main reasons that I'm supporting this particular team is because of a relationship. And as you know, relationship moves at the speed of trust. And trust moves at the speed of relationship. These people are visionaries. They're part of the fabric of our community. And they're also dreaming for the next generation. That's what gets me excited. We wanted to really learn what the community wanted, so we decided to do that. We, we wanted to hear from them and get their perspective to make sure that we built something that was for them, by them, with us. Bronzeville lacks businesses that really thrive. And so as a business owner, and I've been one for 20 years, and passionate about women and empowering women, I thought that there was finally an opportunity for Black business owners and Black women to be able to serve in a community that has been so dismal, right? And so because of that, um, you now can walk um, and shop and hopefully eat and dine. And there will be people from all across the world that would want to come to this corridor to be able to experience all of these curated um, Black businesses that are from all over. One village, one vision, one bronze Melanie, so we've got about uh, 20, 25 minutes. Um, let's just get the uh, question started again. Um, the round table, you, you have the option of raising your hand. The only challenge is I cannot see you. So um, I'm going to move again to the questions. Uh, the first question, starting with um, some interest in the design uh, and questions about how the design will uh, blend in to or complement the existing infrastructure on uh, 47th Street. Sure. Um, well, we'll let Juan Moreno, the architect, take that one. Thank you. Happy to start off. Uh, good evening, everybody. Thrilled and honored to share some of those uh, comments. Now, one thing that was important to this entire team is to recognize that Bronzeville has been an incubator of innovation. There's a lot of people that don't recognize that Frank Lloyd Wright did his, some of his first homes in Bronzeville. So that epitomizes innovation more than just about any American architect. And I think when you look at buildings like the Harold Washington Cultural Center and others that stand out on their own, I think this building has that opportunity. That's what we're trying to achieve. It's really one that, yes, at first glance, it feels different. But when you look more profoundly, the ideas really stem from what's in the context. It's all within a contemporary conversation but very much it's ingrained into the neighborhood. Thank you. And, mm -hmm. and, and one, there's also a question about 
this the streetscape um, and again the facade uh, sort of b blending into the streetscape. Um, can you talk about the design in terms of how you would uh, control the flow of business um, and in traffic? Yeah, happy to handle that one as well. So one is if you look that the building is carefully pulled back from the street, we recognize it's a taller building. That's, that's absolutely clear. But I think that's also a way to just make a building more inviting and welcome people into a grand plaza. So I think the scale of the plaza, and when you look closely at even how we've dealt with human scale along the lower levels of the building, it's a building that has human scale aspects. And I think that's really wonderful. Now, the other thing that we're doing in the building is thinking about alternative forms of transportation. So you saw in the diagrams talking about Divi being a platform for moving people. So look, the hope is that this isn't such a car centric development, that it's one that really looks at alternative forms of movement and encourages um, people to use elements other than the car. Thank you. Mm -hmm. So as you'll see, there are lots of questions in the Q&A that are, that are uh, speaking to the unique design of the building. I'm going to shift gears a little bit and ask about uh, the businesses and um, how many of those businesses um, that have been identified are, are Bronzeville-centric uh, and are um, already based in, in the community. Sure, actually a good um, good portion of ours, and I need to pull up the, the list, there's about 13 of them, but um, essentially uh, Juan is a part of the community, Larvetta is a part of the community, she was on the video L3, we have um, uh, Buffaloes, and I um, can't think of the name right now. Um, Penny's Tea. Hmm? Penny's Tea. Penny's tea, um, and then more, more, all of them, as far as the black owned businesses are from Chicago. And then there's a good portion of them that are from the Bronzeville area. Um, and so the other one that I was thinking of was Jackie. Um, she owns the black owned Kilwins over in downtown and Hyde Park, but she's opening a new chain uh, here for this particular site. Thank you. And there's the follow up is a question about sort of uh, Bronzeville's history around supporting small entre entrepreneurs and not necessarily uh, box chain businesses. How are you accommodating for the, the historical and somebody stop me if it's not true uh, of um, sort of the emphasis on uh, local entrepreneurs and small businesses as opposed to larger chain um, retailers? Sure, we have a great answer for that, but Tori, do you want to, to chime in? I can uh, keep going if you want. To. Sure, about the uh, retailers in, in particular, can you repeat the question? I apologize, I just want to make sure I'm clear on it. I guess the question is how, how in, in your proposal and, and your strategy, how are you thinking about supporting uh, local entrepreneurs uh, to, to, to in, in exchange and in, in not so much the, the larger tail retailers? Oh, absolutely. I think um, as uh, Melanie just stated, there are several local entrepreneurs that um, we already have letters of commitment from to uh, work with us in the space. But in addition to that, you know, we would do similar to what we did with some of the other projects across the city. Uh, you know, it all starts with the community presentation. Like this is the first part of the process. And then once you're selected, that's when the work actually begins where, you know, we take our cubes from the community. We go in, we learn who those local entrepreneurs are. We reached out to several of them. Um, you know, I won't call their names in particular. Some decided to be a part of the team. Some said, hey, let's wait. And if you're selected, then we'll be a part of the team. But everything that we do is community focused. And, and we make sure that all, that the community informs us of who are the local entrepreneurs that should be a part of the project. Right, and to add on to that, um, the national brands were really brought in there to offset the cost for our black owned businesses to afford to be there. And so um, a lot of the ones that will be there have um, either a community focus, a mission focus, an incubator attached, something that is giving back to that community or training someone else for that next generation of black entrepreneurship. And then we also have the Nextdoor app 
um, that we kind of highlighted on the video. Essentially, because I live in Brownsville, I essentially said, hey, what, what do we need? What do you guys have? And we had a ton of responses. And some of them we sent to QCDC and said, hey, um, you know, I want to open a daycare, but she wasn't started yet. So we sent them to QCDC to hopefully help them with their business plan so that they can be ready for something like this. And we have other partners like Lovetta who met us through that site, who is a Brownsville resident that will be a part of this as an LOI as well. So we took multiple approaches as far as how can we um, get our black owned businesses aware and prepared to be in this development. Thank you. Can you talk about the uh, cost of the, the project and how you were planning to finance it? Sure, Fred. Yes, hi. Uh, yeah, so our, our um, the cost is about fifty million dollars, and the how we plan to finance is through traditional construction financing. Um, we also plan on putting a, a first mortgage on the retail space, and then as well as um, some TIF dollars, and then essentially we'll round it out with some with, with equity. And and Fred, on that question, there's a follow up as to um, is that only for the building, or are they for the other two sites as well? No, uh, the 50 million is uh, specifically for um, the, 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 the submission. Thank you. For, for, for this can, building, yes. If I can just give a brief follow up to, uh, you know, since the, uh, since the proposal was released to the public, we've had a lot of questions that have come to us prior to even tonight's submission. And, you know, one of the questions was, you know, it's such a large building, is there a possibility to scale the project back? And again, you know, for us and, and understanding the direction of the city and direction of the commissioner, we wanted to propose what we thought is the best vision. But again, after having a community conversation, if it makes sense to scale the project a little bit further back, that will bring down the cost of the, the total development cost as well. So I did want to just throw that out there that we are sensitive to the responses that we're getting to the structure. Yeah. And there is a, okay, go ahead, sorry. I'm sorry, just the last addition to that, because I think all of those answers are so great. Um, the other thing that we did in comparison to the other projects was just do simple math, divide the, the cost divided by the number of units, and ours is somewhere about 695K a unit. Um, one of the other proposals is 891K a unit, and the other one is 760K a unit. And um, I mean, we could take down the units, but then you lose some of that value. Um, our group has it in our um, agreement that we're giving 1% of our revenues into our program. So, um, and our program costs are already built into our numbers. So when you talk about what you're getting for the value, you're getting more building, you're getting more retailers, you're getting, um, actual programs that have already been thought out and built out that are already signing LOIs to be there. And then um, in general cost to value, you're getting a lot more for less instead of just a one building that doesn't have an LOI yet or doesn't have any thought to how you would utilize it yet. Thank you. Um, are, there, are there plans to develop other lots uh, adjacent to the property or in the neighborhood? Of course. <laughs> so um, that was the simple answer. But yes, as the video showed, we have a phase two or phase two and three, depending on um, what we can work out with the city. We want to do those as soon as possible because we really see it as a, an entire corridor that we can fill up very quickly, um, just with knowing some of the other things that are coming in the area um, and the hopes for hotels and other things like that, we would hope and would love to be a part of those things as far as um, walking down the block and, and pointing out more lots and saying, what do we need there and how can we integrate it? And you know, do we put our Divi bikes right there from the green line to our site and then have some from, from you know, the corner, whatever. So we, we've definitely thought about um, the entire block and corridor as it needs to be synonymous and it needs to come together. We can't just think about one specific RFP site, which is why we wanted to talk about how much more we could bring to the table um, given the resources. Thank you. I'll just, add, I'll just add a little bit to that to say we did identify which lots, um, you know, along this corridor are city owned and which ones are privately owned. And so we did reach out to um, some of the privately owned 
uh, individuals as well. Um, but we also have to wait and see if the city is going to uh, issue RFPs on the additional uh, city lots. Thank you. And so there's a question about the um, one, the number of floors in the building and um, the whether there's going to be a market, it's a, a market rate building. Um, I'm sorry, or, and have you built a market rate building of this size before? Sure. Um, Harv, do you want to go for what we've built in the past? Did you say Herb? Uh, yes, I did. Okay. All right. Sorry. Uh, this is Herb Dawson with O'Neill Construction. Uh, currently, we, we, we actually have built Taylor Street uh, similar to this. Uh, we have another project right now uh, going up a little larger scale. Uh, but as far as uh, mixed use, uh, uh, O'Neill, myself, have done quite a few, quite a few. And we understand the market. Uh, we have uh, a crew of maybe 15 estimators, uh, pre-construction wise, uh, to understand the current market, keeping track of the current market. Everybody's afraid of like steel and lumber, these things like that. Uh, we have our commodity guys looking at that all the time. And uh, there are signs at the end of the year that's going to come down. Uh, that should be a benefit for this project uh, in, the, in the coming year. So uh, as far as that goes, uh, the expertise of uh, working with this type of project and the relationship we have with Millhouse as well. We've done a number of projects. Uh, American Airlines, the largest hangar that's out there at uh, uh, here right now, uh, has a clear span of 520 feet. So the opening in this building is, <laughs> I think we could do it quite well. And also we have, we have worked several jobs at the University of Chicago just recently, probably four years ago, we did a $174 million science building uh, just down the street. Thank you so much. Um, so we're gonna be wrapping up uh, maybe four more minutes, two more questions. Uh, the the uh, first of is the, um, the size of the projects will have an impact on the single family homes in the area. Um, again, there's a question about parking and um, traffic being driven to the, to the um, community as a result of the project. Again, I, can you just address that, those two concerns? Sure, let's take the first one. Sarah, do you wanna talk about, um, I guess, home values and how we kind of see that going from the realty side? So I was trying to look at the question in the chat, but from a single family, this is a different stock unit, two and three bedroom units will be a majority, <clears throat> excuse me, of, of the building. And it will, uh, it will admit the single family because we know there's a different type of housing stock for smaller families, more walkable, pedestrian friendly. And as the market is shifting, because in about 2018, we had absorption rates of as high as seven months. Right now, it's kind of decreased We're down to two or three months of absorption rates. So now the, the need is for more housing. And just looking at the indicators, it seems that these housing indicators from a financial position, the uh, interest rate would be at a lower rate and it would be nice me being from the south side would just see others take advantage of that and take advantage of the equity as well. In addition to that, it will just be more of a uh, walkability space. So the retail at the bottom, it can serve residents in the building, but we want to serve more than just the residents in the building. We want to serve the community. So I live in South Shore, so it would be nice not to have to go past Roosevelt to do some shopping and just to bring dollars and keep dollars in our neighborhood. And as we see home prices increasing six, seven hundred thousand dollars we want those dollars to remain in the community. And since it's on an SSA, that would be more services that could be along that corridor as well. So from a housing standpoint, I think that's kind of where that will offset and be more friendly. And then for the second question, I think Wilbur, we, we talked about traffic and I think that was the second question was about cars and traffic and how we would handle yes. that or yes. was it? Okay. Sure, I'll jump into that one just a little bit. From an engineering perspective, each and every project that would be on this site would have to be modeled from to figure out what needs to be done. Um, and we would look at those different models to validate that how we should handle traffic and ease congestion, as well as making sure that it's safe to cross the street and making sure that the individuals in the neighborhood can experience the entire neighborhood and not be isolated off to one side because motorists are flying through. So that's more of an engineering perspective that will be handled well early in the process. And the last question, and we'll wrap this up and move to the, the final team for the evening. Um, it's just simply the um, 
question around uh, modernization of the CTA. And I don't know that you can answer it, but we'll ask it anyways. Um, are there plans for um, to modernize the 47th Street CTA station to complement this project as well as the other two projects? I don't think I can answer that question, but okay. we sure hope so because Millhouse has a very strong infrastructure background. So those are the type of things that we can integrate very easily. We did the 95th Street, Street Station Red Line, um, and we've done a lot of work where adding the bike lanes, adding the transportation aspects are forward thinking things that we do. And so that's very easy for us to tap into if asked by the city or if we can make that agreement ahead of time when we're talking about uplifting the corridor and making things easier for the people that would like to live here. We would love to have that conversation. Thank you. So thank you, um, the Broads Village team. Uh, Melanie, thank you so much. Um, if you all can turn your cameras now off and- Thank you. Uh, I'm going to ask the final team to step forward, uh, Lee Reed and um, 47th and Vincennes Efford. Um, Lee, as we queue up the video, if you would be so kind as to introduce the project and your team. Okay. Um, hi, everyone. Good evening. Um, we, our team is made up of um, Chicago Neighborhood Initiatives. They are uh, a nonprofit co-developer. Uh, my firm, Revere Properties, we are a co-developer as well. Um, Loop Capital, uh, Chairman Jim Reynolds is uh, our third uh, co-developer and owner. And um, the Gachard Project, uh, Andre and Francis Gachard, uh, co-owners of the Gachard Gallery, as well as the Gachard Project LLC. That's our development team. Uh, we have a host of, um, of other uh, team members, uh, Brook Architecture, um, Rap Architecture, um, Site Plus Design, um, uh, Powers Construction, uh, Julia Perkins, Principal of MBMD Strat Strategic Consultants, um, and um, the Chicago Urban League. Um, I think that should hit just about everybody. Um, that, so that, that's the makeup of our team. Excellent, thank you. So if we are ready uh, to get this video um, and started, again, reminders that if you cannot see the video, um, a link will be pasted in the chat uh, so that you can ex access it um, on your own. Kimberly or Kevin, are we ready? Yes, I believe somebody from the team is going to start sharing now. Okay. Thank Thanks. You. Team, are we ready? I don't know who. Julia, are you ready? Good evening. My name is Lee Reed. I'm an architect and president of Revere Properties. We were the primary. The video. You can't hear? You can hear. Can't see it. Okay, let me stop share and do it again. Same this one. Okay. Can can you see now? We, we can only see your toolbar at the top. Developers of the Brownfield now? Artist Loss as well as co-owners of that project. We oh. felt very strong. Yeah. Yet. Not so yet. You might have to do it on your end, Lee. I am so sorry. I do apologize. All right, let me see if I can do it. You see it? No. And again, a reminder that of the three teams, uh, if there are other teams, we're asking you again to 
uh, stop with um, your responses and to turn your cameras and mics off. Thank you. Sorry, are we ready? I'm sorry, can, can, I didn't get any feedback as to whether we could see it or not. No, we can't, we can't see, see it. it. We cannot see it, Lee. And again, I thank everyone for your patience. We were just having a little challenge this evening with videos, but um, it seems to, we're gonna work it out. And again, if you are um, looking for the link, you can find it in your chat. Lee, is there something I could help? Uh, I've got it queued up on my computer. I just don't know how to move it over to the Zoom. So there's a stop share. Let's just see if we- Share screen? Yes. And then you okay. want to optimize the sound. So there's an option for that too. There's two buttons, you just click on them. Yeah. All right, let's try it. We were the primary developers of the Brownsville Artist Loss, as well as co-owners of that project. We felt very strongly that a holistic approach- Can you start it over? That yes. would assure a track. Again, and full screen, my heart. Good evening. My name is Lee Reed. I'm an architect and president of Revere Pro So Lee, there's a, in the lower right-hand corner, there's a, an arrow Got there. It. Okay. That All right. Okay, here we go. One more time. Good evening. My name is Lee Reed. I'm an architect and president of Revere Properties. We were the primary developers of the Brownsville Artist Loss, as well as co-owners of that project. We felt very strongly that a holistic approach was needed. That would assure attraction of existing and established businesses, new entrepreneurs, as well as homeowners as they look to find new housing and condominiums in this area. Our proposed project far exceeds the requested RFP solicitation by proposing two additional buildings across the street, both on vacant city-owned land. A vital part of our development focuses on dining, healthy food, and culinary experiences in roughly half of the 41,000 square feet of retail space created in our plan. It also provides areas in and around the development to promote local art and artists, outdoor dining, and entertainment experiences. Our plan also proposes 46 new condominium and rental housing units. Our Bronzeville community stakeholders and impressive development team have all come together to make this project a catalyst for accelerating the full return of glory to Bronzeville. When I think about being a part of a development like this in Bronzeville, where we're going to revitalize retail, we're going to revitalize housing with condos, with rental units, affordable, and really brighten and add economic development and commerce into the community, I am very, very excited about being a part of that. We think it's time for black developers to actually have significant economic participation in these projects. It's my intention uh, in this project to be a major participant. We are committed to ensuring that this new development involves art and culture. We will be super excited to collaborate with our new development team that is bringing on several new cultural businesses and diversifying them with well-needed businesses in the community. We truly love Bronzeville and we are committed to making a better community, working with others and collaborating to make sure that this community soars and becomes the destination for people all around the world. Hi, my name is Sierra Boatwright. I'm the Vice President of Real Estate and Inclusion for Chicago Neighborhood Initiatives. CNI is a nonprofit organization. We focus on high impact real estate development throughout Chicago's underserved neighborhoods. We've developed in neighborhoods across the city, like Inglewood, Pullman. Pullman has been home for us. For the last 10 years or so, we've coordinated about $450 million of investment. Public-private partnerships creating over 1,800 jobs. 
Franzville is a neighborhood that we're really excited to continue our development efforts in. We're absolutely thrilled to join the 47th and Vincennes development team. We're committed to supporting community, engaging residents, supporting entrepreneurship, and building black wealth and engaging local talent so that our development truly reflects the community. We take a lot of pride in Bronzeville, not only from its historical perspective, but, but frankly, um, we built a lot of housing in Bronzeville and we're very proud of it. And uh, we want to continue to be a part of that, making sure that we bring communities up as part of our, again, part of our mission. And do a project such as this is a labor of love. Uh, we're community uh, conscious and very community active. And so um, this project would be very, um, fit very well in our wheelhouse. Good afternoon, everyone. My name is Ramona Westbrook. I'm president of Brook Architecture, and we're really excited to be here. Um, we are the architecture firm that will be designing the building for the RFP site at 47th and Vincennes, and working with this fantastic team of architects to really develop the entire block and create a destination that's pretty robust. Our building is a five-story mixed-use building that will offer a variety of activities and uh, a destination uh, for, for the site. We have designed a five-story mixed-use building that offers a destination for a variety of uses and activities. The building is divided into three sections, an anchor tenant at the east end, a residential tower at the west end, and a central atrium that serves as an indoor-outdoor gathering space year-round. We thought it important to activate the exposed corner at the east end of the site, and as such, decided to locate the most vibrant activity of the anchor retail tenant at that location. We provided a two-story, 10,000 square foot space in a relatively transparent enclosure that will allow the activity to take place inside the building while being viewed from the exterior. We anticipate attracting a small format grocer and an upscale restaurant. At the roof level of this building, we have planned a green roof outdoor event space. The retail entrance is set back from the street at the west end of the building. The tower on floors two through five house 30 apartments. At the first floor of the tower, small format retail stores will spill out onto the sidewalk and invite patrons into a variety of experiences. We have designed the units with overhead garage doors so that during the summer months, the retailers can open the doors and expand their space to the sidewalk with an activity of their choice. We found it advantageous to introduce a through building atrium that could channel the sun's rays and its benefits throughout the building. The atrium would also serve as a gathering space for public events and informal dining. My name is Lilbert Lewis. I'm a project architect. The concept with this design was being inspired by the two existing buildings and the triangle sculpture that's next to the Richard's Gallery. The idea was just to have this building to respect what was traditional on the block, but also complement at the same time. I'm Ravi Ricker, and this is uh, Cheryl Noel, and we're Rap Architecture. We were the original architects for the Bronzeville Artist Loft, the adjacent building, and um, we were really excited to be working with this team again. We're proposing a new four-story mixed-use mass timber building inspired by the unique structure we restored inside the Bronzeville Artist Loft building. The new sustainable wood components will result in a similar beautiful wood interior. Developing the vacant land east of the Bronzeville Artist Loft building was part of the original vision for that project. And we're thrilled to be part of the team to move that vision forward. The first floor has a full service restaurant with a flexible event space and a solar panel glazed atrium that opens to a patio with garden seating. The public entrance is on 47th Street and the residential entrance is on Vincennes. On the second floor, a restaurant mezzanine overlooks the atrium and an artist maker space with a proposed music program. The third and fourth floors are loft condominiums with a residential roof deck above. We are and have been invested in this community. And we believe that this holistic approach where we look at all of the vacant land in our area is necessary for us to create enough scale for this to be a successful development.
Excellent. Thank you so much. Um, if we can stop the share. Here we go. So um, with that, I am inviting um, the roundtable and um, the community to ask questions of the 47th and Vicenz partnership. Um, and we can start with uh, a question um, ab about the, um, the corner, it looks like the, um, the so the someone, some of the renderings are showing a solid gray block at the corner. Is that how the corner will be? Uh, what's, you know, what's the image that's showing? I'm, I'm not sure what that's referring to, but perhaps. Um, I'm going to let Ramona, who's the architect for that, for that building in that corner, address that. But I mean, from my perspective, it's, it's a, a combination of milky glass that as the, as the night comes, you see more and more through the building, but I'll let Ramona elaborate. Thank you, Lee. Um, so the, the image that you saw of that corner building actually is not a, a perfect representation of what will be there. As Leah stated, the, the corner of that building will actually be um, primarily translucent. Um, we will be using um, glass so that you will be able to view the activity that will be taking place inside the building um, throughout the day and even more so in the evening hours. So the idea is that um, you have a very vibrant and active space, but it's vibrant and active in a con in a controlled environment. And Ramona, while you're unmiked, there's a question about the treatment of and of any landscape architecture components. Could you address those? Two? Absolutely. So um, we also talk about the through building atrium that we've introduced um, towards. Uh, towards the center of the building. And the intent is that that atrium will um, have trees and landscaping within that space so that you will also have access to um, an indoor, an outdoor space indoors uh, during the winter months, which we tend to have more of here in Chicago. In addition to that, we have a green roof above our um, anchor tenant space, which actually takes up about a third of the footprint of the building that will be landscaped for, um, for activity as well. Thank Ernie, you. Ernie, if you, if, uh, you wanna unmute and, and maybe throw in any more Yeah, absolutely. So as Ramona was mentioning, the, the courtyard truly is really an important space. Uh, you know, as we talk about controlled spaces uh, and, and it really brings in the, the light into the building as well. Um, one of the things that I did want to talk about is, you know, in terms of the context of, of this being such a dominant uh, um, location on 47th Street, really engaging with the entire streetscape, I think is going to be really important. And especially because of the multiple buildings, we start to connect those two, uh, you know, the several buildings all at one time. Uh, so, you know, we're looking at really, uh, it, taking the landscape and actually putting it onto the street and uh, extending that as well. And if I can add one more element um, with regard to the through building um, atrium, there's also great opportunities for green space um, at the rear of the building. So even when you're park parking, you will be engaged with the landscape and that landscaping will be seen through the entire building. So we've been very thoughtful about making sure that we have green space that you've got a comfortable um, environment to engage in. So there's, thank you, Ramona. There's two questions. One about, uh, again, cost and financing, and then another about uh, the restaurant. Uh, and has that, uh, what type of restaurant are you thinking about for the space? Um, so we, we've been thinking about um, a series of, of restaurants. You know, it's a 5,000 square foot space. And, um, the thought is, is that it's likely that we'll end up with, you know, maybe two or to three smaller restaurants, uh, almost in a, a, a food court kind of environment, but, but, but sit down restaurants. Um, and that hopefully will, will uh, create an opportunity for some food culinary choices for the residents in the community. And can you talk about cost and financing, Lee? Uh, Cedric, are you, on, you're on, right? Uh, yes, I am. The, uh, the total cost of the project is, is approximately $41,700,000. Um, 
the the financing will be uh, new market tax credits, grants, and equity. Uh, and we're going to focus on finding the equity. It's going to be minority partners, uh, as we've done on other projects. Because again, building wealth in the community is is key for us and uh, and revitalizing uh, the neighborhood and the project. Thank you. Um, can you highlight how? Uh, you will um, embed an intergenerational component and in particular um, highlighting young founder owner that's part of your team? Um, yes, um, so we, we are committed to um, helping out in, in community build, wealth building and financial empowerment. So we have, you know, we have a partner in the Chicago Urban League that will help us work through some entrepreneurship programming uh, assistance. Uh, CNI is providing uh, micro, micro loans uh, to some of our uh, new businesses as well as established businesses as necessary. And then we are, are working through a training and support program, again, with the Urban League Partnership, uh, which will support community financial growth and stability through jobs and workforce development programming. I'd also like uh, the charts to, to talk about a little bit about kind of the art perspective of, of community engagement and, and participation. Thank you, Lee, and thank you, everyone. Good evening for the opportunity to present to you this evening. One of the amazing things that have happened with the Bronzeville Artist Loft is the synergy between the residents and the commercial space. Currently, Gallery Guichard employs several of the residents as bar managers, artists that exhibit. So we are looking at a similar concept where residents of the new RFP would also be employees of the business. And we wanna make sure that the arts are a part of this development because so often we see whether it's Lincoln Park, Wicker Park, the arts are involved in the development but they're often lost. So by having art related businesses like art schools, music schools, as well as expanding the public art in the corridor with more murals on the RFP wall, as well as the Bronzeville Artist Loft, we're keeping the synergy and the colorful landscape that comes with some of the areas like Wynwood to keep the excitement. Plus the following that we have currently with 16 years in the community, nine years at 35th and King Drive, seven years here at the RFP location, we're going to be very intentional in directing our programming to benefit our new partners in the development. So those new commercial businesses will receive benefit of the large crowd. So we're not sending thousands of people to Hyde Park or to South Loop to eat and dine. We'll be able to continue that excitement right at our new development. And having been in the community since 2005, 16 years and seven years here on 47th Street, we've built a really great following of people here in the community, but also around the world. So we have become a destination. Um, just recently, we had 4,500 people here in Bronzeville moving around for the Art District Trolley Tour. And so that type of synergy is what we continue and want to continue to bring. We've been doing it and we wanna to continue to bring more arts and culture to the Bronzeville community. Um, one, one more thing I'd like to add, uh, Sierra, uh, if you're there, uh, could you maybe, or David speak to um, your, your past experiences with microloans and what they've done to bring uh, businesses into the community from people that live in the communities? Sure, I'm happy to. This is Sierra um, from CNI. So CNI has a, a subsidiary called CNI's Microfinance Group. And so our focus is to deploy loans to small businesses to really address those barriers that many of our entrepreneurs experience, which is access to capital. And so we've deployed over $4 million in loans to small businesses. One thing that's really important to note, over 80% of our borrowers are African-American. Over 90% are considered MBE in some capacity, minority in some capacity. And so that's really important for us when we talk about being intentional about really bridging gaps and creating resources and, and removing barriers for entrepreneurship. It speaks directly to the wealth building component. 
We want to make sure that our small businesses, our entrepreneurs thrive in the community, not just survive in the community. We've been doing that far too long. But it's also important to note, we can't just give them capital. We need to make sure that we're partnering with the Chicago Urban League to provide that needed technical assistance to really ensure that they're building capacity. So that approach is the approach that we'll take on this development as well. Thank you, Sierra. And I just want to be, we've got about six more minutes. There's a question about equity and another about uh, the ownership breakdown of the project. Um, David, you want to address that one? Sure. Um, yeah, so we're, we're committed to providing uh, $5 million of equity as uh, the ownership team. Um, between the four of us, we will contribute that $5 million. Um, we haven't decided or figured out exactly what the percentage is that will be uh, based on kind of the, the equity raise. Thank you, David. And can David, can you also speak a little bit to because CNI is a nonprofit, what your what your exit strategy look might look like uh, coming down the road, and what that would mean for the rest of of the partners, the development partners. Yeah, I think um, particularly on the new market tax credits, uh, you know, that has a seven year in, uh, life and, and investment period. And uh, the goal would be after that seven year period, basically to contribute that imputed equity through the new market tax credits into the project uh, as additional project equity. So in essence, that uh, call it 10 million of new market tax credit becomes free equity at the end of the seven years. Thank you, thank you, David. Um, Lee, there's a question about whether this will be, this project is LAED certified uh, design as a whole. Um, Ramona, you, yeah. we, we've, got, we've got three separate buildings. And so I think I'll let um, um, each of them speak briefly to that lead certification on our buildings. Okay, I hope I'm not muted, but I will start. Um, all of the buildings will be at, at the very least will meet the Chicago City of Chicago Building Code sustainability requirements, which actually are uh, pretty robust. Um, our building features a green roof and also um, an extensive amount of lighting or, or windows so that we will have natural light uh, throughout the space. Um, I would say that those are the, the elements that we are really proposed, that we're really pushing. We've also had conversations about uh, solar, uh, incorporating solar panels on our roof to try to take our, to reduce our carbon footprint, footprint and take that uh, step towards sustainability a bit more aggressively than what is required by code. Cheryl and Robbie. Anybody? Oh. Uh, Cheryl, good evening, Robbie. everyone. Okay. Um, so we're RAP Architecture and we designed the building on lot C, uh, on the lots east of uh, the Bronzeville Artist Loft project. And it is, um, we're proposing a mass timber building, which is an incredibly um, sustainable and resilient form of construction. Chicago has a long history of vintage heavy timber buildings, mostly in manufacturing and and warehouse buildings that have been either sadly demolished or um, adaptively reused, like the Bronze Artist Loft building. And so we're excited to um, sort of replicate that history with this new sustainable version of that. And um, sustainability is very important in our work. We really believe it's important to start building more responsibly. Um, We've also, uh, with the atrium, we're doing building integrated photovoltaics. So the atrium itself is a solar panel collection system. Um, and we're really excited about that. It will generate electricity on the site. We can easily, with mass timber, um, achieve lead certification, even potentially net zero, though we haven't set certification goals for any of the products yet. I think that's something that um, still is to be discussed about what certifications, if any, will will be um, pursued. And and there was somebody else that. Yes, and then on the third building, uh, which is the what we call the B building, uh, the intent there is to is to try to go for a lead a lead silver certification. Uh, we intend to you know use. Um, um, uh, sustainable products and pro and materials, but we also intend to have the entire roof uh, uh, be solar, a solar collector. Um, and that's that's about as far as we've gone at this point. And, and that's all built into our, our project costs. 
I'd also point out, Lee, that, um, and I think this is just given the location of the building, that its proximity to public transportation makes it more of a TOD site. We are providing parking um, for the building, but it's not um, one for one. We're providing what is uh, basically required given that it is a transit oriented development. And that uh, intention also reduces our carbon footprint. Thank you. So we have uh, one more question here, which is about the uh, ADA requirements um, and wondering if, if you could address um, how those are being addressed in the design. Absolutely. So our building is completely ADA compliant and wheelchair means meaning that a wheelchair will be able to access all of the required spaces and um, we will be meeting all of uh, MOPD uh, requirements for accessibility. Okay, and then finally, there's a question about, um, so Ms. Gibson, Regina Gibson is asking about the availability of the RFPs. Um, we'll be talking about that next. Um, and then finally, it looks like uh, that the question has been answered. Um, the final question, and then we'll send you off with much gratitude, is just how you will plan to engage the community if your um, proposal is accepted. Um, in the design and rollout of your plan. Yes, we've we've brought uh, part as part of our team Julia Perkins, uh, who who uh, wonderfully helped us when we uh, built and de developed the uh, Brownsville Artist Lost. I'm going to let her speak to our community engagement component. Thank you, Lee. Um, community engagement is an ongoing process. CBD has already started in terms of the round table conversations and they will continue with additional programs that we will dovetail on. You know, our goal is to ensure that, you know, this is a long term commitment, not just during the development, but throughout the life of the program. So social media will be used, surveys would be used, listening sessions would be used. We want to be able to, if we're coming up um, in terms of a concern or issue to share it out with the community to get their feedback, to make sure that we can integrate that on the front end of the project and throughout the life of the project. Um, and another thing about the community engagement too is that we did not name the building. It's just 47th and Vincennes. We want the community to be involved in the naming of what these three, th three buildings are. Um, so we just are calling it 47th Vincennes right now, but it will be named and it, the name will be um, given by the voices in the community. Thank you. Thank you, 47th and Vincennes uh, team. We thank you um, for your patience and we thank all of you. Uh, we're gonna close this portion of the, of the uh, program down. Um, and again, I'm gonna turn this over to um, Kimberly Morris who's gonna walk you through the next steps. Thank you. Thank you so much, uh, Consuela. Um, I'm gonna uh, flip through really quickly um, to cover our next steps for this process. Um, before I do that, I um, wanna again, thank all of the development teams for participating in this evening's uh, developer community, uh, community <laughs> presentation. Um, we see that a lot of hard work has gone into these. And so we really appreciate your responsiveness to the RFP and to the community's desires uh, for what they will want to see on this site. So we're, we're looking forward to uh, these next steps um, and the selection of um, the development, winning development proposal. So on that note, I'll share uh, next steps with everyone. So amid, uh, following this meeting, DPD will be sending out um, to everyone who registered for the meeting, um, links to all of the developer presentations, in addition to um, a Q&A of frequently asked questions based on uh, the comments and uh, that were submitted in the chat both the comments and the questions that were submitted in chat. And then uh, we will be sending out a community scorecard. Uh, so this scorecard is again an official way how you will submit 
your feedback to DPD. Uh, so each development uh, proposal will have a list of questions that we ask you to respond to. Um, in addition to that, we will be um, including a video from this evening and again, those links to all of our uh, developer videos that were submitted. So once all of the input has been reviewed, um, a winning team will be selected um, and we anticipate this happening sometime mid-summer. Um, and then again, um, after DPD selects um, or the community, um, I'm sorry, the evaluation team uh, selects a, rent, a winning respondent, DPD will be referring back to all of the feedback that we received tonight um, and from all of the uh, public meetings uh, to advance the no, uh, negotiations with the winning development team and to demand, amend the proposal as uh, needed. So right now, I do want to kick it to um, our commissioner, Maurice Cox, to close us out for the evening. Um, thank you, Kimberly. Uh, and uh, good evening. Uh, good evening, everyone. Um, and thank you for giving, giving us uh, two hours of your evening. Uh, and it has been uh, an amazing uh, evening at that with um, 300 participants, I think, at the highest um, point in the evening, the highest number of participants we've seen in any community. So, so thank you, uh, Bronzeville, for showing up. This is um, the, the second round of the Invest Southwest um, proposals. Uh, this one focused on uh, 47th Street. And um, I think as a few of the presenters uh, said, uh, Brownsville has uh, been gaining momentum um, for quite some time now. And, and this is really uh, Brownsville's moment. Um, so I just want to thank uh, the Alderman uh, because I think the seeds of the development that you see this evening, uh, they were planted by Alderman Dow and Alderman King. And you are now seeing the, the fruits of their labor. Um, so thank you both for preparing the ground uh, so that Truly, I think Bronzeville is at a, uh, uh, a, a wonderful, wonderful moment. I think the, um, the Lightfoot administration is, is ready to do our part uh, to move these, the, this district forward. Uh, and the evaluation process really begins now and it begins uh, with your help. Um, I think uh, as you can tell, we are learning, the city is learning how to do this. Uh, how do you prepare you know, a community um, to learn along with us um, to create the kind of growth that we all wanted to see on the South Side that's able to be inclusive, that creates local wealth, um, and that ultimately um, will be equitable. And so uh, this is what the process looks like. Uh, we just thank you for your patience and your participation. Uh, I can tell you if we get uh, half of the number of respondents um, to the community scorecard uh, that showed up tonight, that would be 150 um, respondents. Uh, and they will be factored in um, to how the decision is made. Uh, the, the beautiful thing about this evening, and I, I mean, I, I was just smiling inside uh, because of the embarrassment of riches uh, that we have to choose from. Uh, so I, I, I want us to, to choose wisely. Um, and uh, I just want to thank everyone for the work, work and effort that they've put into this, uh, as, Kim, as Kimberly said, including uh, Kimberly Morris, uh, our uh, lead planner for this effort. And of course, Consuela, thank you so much. You are a master at moving us uh, forward and making us really feel heard. So um, thanks everyone. And uh, we uh, look forward to seeing you during the next phase of this amazing journey we're on. So. Thank you and good night, everybody. Thank you all. Thanks, good night. Good night, thank you.